Hey, y'all. How's it going? Fine, thank you. All righty, so I am not Patrick. Let me change my name right here. Do, 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 do. So is it 70 degrees there in Texas yet? Oh man, so well, I'm in Arkansas and yeah, it was like it's 71 yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. But it was like negative 20. It got to negative 20 Fahrenheit like two weeks ago. It was crazy. Um, we had like that winter storm came through here too. So yeah, it was nuts. And Mike lost power for like a, like a week in Texas. Are you there, Mike? Can you hear me? That I did. Wow. Yes, sir, I did. I'm here. Man. Just working. Yeah, so <laughs> what's up As, uh, i'm here i'm just working in the back end yeah right on yeah send out some support emails so this is like an open uh q a session my frame is all apart right now because i'm in the process of moving it uh but i can still help you so um yeah what kind of questions can i help you with Get first you question is how's your storage going how's your everything going Oh man, it, you know, you have all these plans of, of how fast you want to like get stuff done. And I'm like terrible at estimating how long things are going to take. So like, um, boy, we got moved in, but I, I've only gotten the floor squared and level. I don't have any of the walls built or anything. Um, I'm going to try to work on it this afternoon. Now it's a little nicer, but it's been kind of rainy and, and snowy and stuff. So it's a lot slower than I want, but I'm hoping to have it built the next like probably two weeks. Hopefully we'll see. Fingers crossed. Thanks. So yeah, what kind of question you got? Tim, you got a question? What's up? I have, yes. Um, first of all, thank you, Mike, um, for uh, sorting my brother and me out with uh, the M2 getting it sent over. We needed a shim for the uh, Makita. He sorted that all out. Uh, oh. We did get we did get clobbered for tax getting in the country, but that's fine. We 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 anticipated that. Um, I've, so even, I've got. Can I pause you right there? Yeah, sure. I want to find out about that. So even shipping that that small part, that little shim, you still had to pay tax on that. No, on the M2, they on they the pay, they I think they it was about 115 pound for our country, which is about 200 dollars. Yeah, okay. with a VAT. Are you in the UK? So, yes. Okay. I'm trying to, okay. to get all that figured out and see how much everything costs everywhere. So I appreciate it. Yeah. To be that. honest, I I I got a Tim's Way discount, so I used that. And that actually offset the extra cost. So we ended up paying the same amount anyway. So, um, yeah, we, we, we sort of break even on that, um, which is why we did it. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, so um, we've built a frame. So we're going to put it on a frame. And I've got it pretty close. There's a bit that's probably about a mil out. Um, we wanted to cut the feet off either level to the, level to the, the, the ground. Um, but you say... In your one that you mount on the wall and everything, it has to be at least 12 inches from the ground. Is that the same for the frame one, or can you lower the feet down? Can you just cut the base off effectively lower it as long as you keep the angle correct? Yeah, so yes, as long as you keep the angle correct is is fine. So the the 12 foot is just for to help you get these measurements correct between yep. it doesn't help because mine's apart, but uh <laughs> you want to make sure that you have the distance high enough from your top beam to your waste board. So it needs to be at least 18 inches for the calculations and stuff. So that's the main reason why it has 12 inches up. So if you make it a little shorter, you'll just have to kind of shorten this too um, and kind of keep it the same, the same way. So you're like, you'll make sure that that, that those ratios stay the same. Basically. Yeah. And you also have to, you also have to understand that if it's too short, that you're going to have a little skippage your sled. That's what happens to mine is when it's a little too low, and it when when it's running across the top, it like it wants to jack, it wants to go up. So I have to move my top. I have to move my top beam a little higher. Right, so I don't, I don't understand. So if I'm just say for argument's sake, because at the moment I, the legs are just square and they're sitting on the corners on the feet effectively. If I say shave two feet, I've put stood upright and put a line across it level with the floor effectively get a level across it and cut those feet off and lower it are you saying that's going to affect the cutting of 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 anything on the board it won't as long as you keep the ratio between like the waste board and this the same Top. so you can right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Down. yes exactly and that's fine. the reason you need it is for the sled to be able to go down below exactly. the sled the sled is like you know 18 inches across and so 
you need to be nine inches below the bottom of your board of what you're cutting. Uh, glad to have no, something. Yeah, I, no, I understand that. What we're, we're hoping to do is maybe shave two inches off the bottom of the legs so that we can get it into the garage because that two inches oh, makes yeah. a big difference of where, how we place it. So we're, oh, we're, yeah, we're you effectively. Can you can definitely so that, do that. As long as, yeah. sled, as long as your sled, you can go down, your sled can go down, and then it's not hitting your floor, you can definitely. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, and no, we're, we're only talking if we brought it down. It, it would take two inches off. We still have more than nine inches at the bottom. So because the, we've built a frame because we want to take it to pieces and move it at a later date. So that's the first question. So that, thank you for that. So yeah. uh, the, the other thing is the accuracy on the router to the center of um, the sled. I've been using a vernier caliper with a, a bit in it, and I've got it down to about uh, 0 0.5 millimeters. Um, is that good enough? That's great. Yeah. Oh, great. It can and, yeah. and get you know it's not worth going any further than that then. I mean you can. Mike you has can. what's yeah. yours at Mike? Mine's at zero point like three. Like you know, but it's it's I had mine at like 0. 0.7, I think. Um wow. I took all mine down. So uh but I calibrated mine a lot though. I calibrated mine a lot. Yeah, I must admit I spent I spent about two hours just sitting know. there and just making sure and double check and double check and then did it again another hour later and, and got it even more accurate. You know what I mean? So it is a bit of fiddling, but yeah, I have managed to get it point five, so I don't touch it now. I mean, yeah, that's that's great because it's I mean that's that's 0.5 mil on like that entire four by eight space. Yeah. So you know that that you're cutting across and, and it's not a magic machine that's gonna do everything. You're always gonna no. have to do a little bit of finishing and a little bit of like you know shaving and no. rounding and, and all that kind of stuff on your projects anyway. So yeah, under under a millimeter is great. And um, yeah. what we say is like if you're getting under three millimeters, then that's gonna help you the that's good. So that's kind of like the target. Um, mm. is that under three, under like uh, it's like eighth of an inch to a sixth of an inch is so a three yeah. mil to like eight, eight mil is, um, is golden. Like if you're, if you're getting that, cause, cause it's, it's on such a huge workspace that as it's moving across, it depends on your project. So if you're building like furniture, you might want to, you know, get those tolerances a little bit better. But, um, if you're, if you're getting like down to, to six mil or three mil or below, like if you get under one, then it's awesome. You're doing okay. Great. Okay. The other thing is when, so thank you for answering these questions. The other thing is, um, we we are either intending of doing so over here um, at the moment. It's really big to convert um, work vans into camper vans, yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. Like vans so the, stuff, yeah. yeah. So basically, we 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 want to build some furniture that goes inside vans and stuff like that. So we were trying to. Um, I was a bit concerned about utilizing the whole board of four by eight, um, and and there's. Um, what's the issues when you reach the end is it worthwhile me putting i think you called it a skirt option mm -hmm. round just just to stop it tipping either way so that helps a lot um because otherwise you're gonna have to like hold it like when it goes over to the side um you, yeah. you gotta kind of like balance it so it doesn't go like burr. um but so the skirt um like like mike was talking about it just helps it to go as the sled sticks over the edge then it doesn't it doesn't rock rock side to side or move or anything like that. So that's one way that you can help it. And then I know a lot of people have done twelve foot beams too to make their beam um, taller. But I know people have still done that with the twelve with the ten foot beam to get all the way to the ends. So I mean yeah, that's that, possible that, too. Yeah, that was the next thing. When we get to that point, I'll be called, I'll be talking to you again because I know you mentioned if you move the pins, you, you might be able to gain more on the on the eight by ten eight eight, eight by four sheet. So mm -hmm. we'll we'll worry about that as well. And then the last thing, which is a bit further down down um oh what's it yeah i've talked about that. um the last thing was um i'm not at this stage yet but when you get to doing id carving 3d relief and stuff like that when you do rough cuts and last cuts when you do a rough cut is it just a matter of increasing the offset when you're on the on the milling component when it's going around it and then you know changing the offset again when you when you put a different bit in was it a lot more complicated than that so as you're kind of like carving in um to something oh no no say carving a shape for arguments like like a, a relief drawing in other, in other in other words so i noticed that when some people have done it they, like a bold eagle for argument's sake a, a, a relief shirt, and they've done like a, a first cut um a rough cut and then they go right back with a second cut oh mm -hmm. the question was how, how when you set up the rough cut what do you do you just just increase the offset from where where it is so it plays outside of your measurements and then go back over again with the offset correct yeah stuff like other. that Stuff like that, you have to play around with it. It's more of a, of a preference. You have preference. So it's kind of hard to tell you what to visualize exactly what you're trying to get to. Yeah. That makes That's sense. Right. Yeah. But thank, thank you. 
yeah but thank you you've been really helpful and uh, uh we will i will be i'll be constantly on here because I, I like i said we'll i think tomorrow and friday we're actually building we, i've built the frame um but i haven't built the so i've got I've got the two end pieces so i've just got to build the rest of it and calib and get the chains and everything on it and then from there my brother's a bit more of a computer geek so he's doing all the software and doing all that sort of thing so um but yeah if we get problems i think we'll be back in contact you've been really helpful guys so far so really thank you Awesome. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I haven't done a lot of, um, of like 3d reliefs and 3d cutting and like, and digging in like that. So I, I don't have tons of experience with that, but I think that doing the offsets, like you said, should work, um, should work good. And like, and doing, you know, you could do like a quick pass with an upcut bit and then do like a downcut bit or something like that to kind of like change it and sw swap your bits out too. So there, there's, that's one of the cool things about it being like an awesome cutting robot is you can just, you can change it and customize it however you want. So, you know, you yeah. can, you can go through and do, you know, one bit cut and then you can go through and do like a finer bit and do some fine uh, detail. And I know Casey does a lot of that. I see him raising his hand too. Um, yeah. he, he does like multiple passes like that a lot. Yeah. So you want to talk to him about it? What I'll do, yeah. What I'll do is I'll create a single drawing. And then if I want to do a rough cut and then a fine cut pass or a detailed pass, create a drawing and then I'll do my offset at exactly the diameter of whatever my detailed bit's going to be. So if I'm using a 16th or a 1 8 inch detailed bit, I'll have my drawing and then I'll offset in your drawing by 1 8 And then I will literally use, I have a 2.25 uh, router. I'll throw a half inch bit in that thing and I'll rip the board like crazy. And then I'll take, and then whenever that drawing's done, it goes over to home. Then I can go ahead and change out to that small one eighth inch bit. And then I put it, and then I load the second drawing with a detail pass on it and just hit play and it'll go through and it'll smooth it all out, clean it up and put nice sharp corners and everything. But the thing is, is it saves a ton of time because you can use a half inch down cut bit on that thing and yeah. it'll, it'll cut your mill time two thirds, two thirds okay. at least. Okay, I, I will be talking to you, Casey, because obviously, obviously you've, you, by the looks of it, you've, you've set up, is, is, is it just, have you, with you on the set up for a small business where you've got several of these machines? This is my hobby. Oh, right. Well, wow. <laughs> I, I actually have two CNCs and a 3D printer and everything. It's just, this is how I get away from work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me the same. Uh, the last last question, I'm sorry, and I'll leave you to. I'll, I'll sort of let you on. Um, uh, the the milling bits, down cut, up cut, compression, straight cut. What do I use for what? <laughs> it's just like um, I um, I was just going to use straight cut for say. So I want to cut 18 millimeter ply, say a birch ply or something like that. What's the best thing to cut with that to get a reasonable finish on it that I don't have to do too much work? And is it like a compression? Is it a down cut, up cut? What what? So I, I can give you, I can give you my two cents on that real quick. I mean, rules, I mean, you'll find your own way, but for me, um, if I'm cutting plywood, I generally use a down cut and the face that's on the front of my cutting surface, that's the face I'm going to have people see because you don't have any blowout on the edge of your board. Inside, you might have some blowout. So I use a down cut for that. My compression bits, they get really hot. Yep. and don't last long. So I usually don't even buy compression bits. Um, I use down cut bits on that straight bits. I use on aluminum and plexi. That's what I use those for. And generally, if I'm running those, I run a much slower uh, IPM on those. So on, if I'm using a quarter inch to a half inch bit on plywood, I'll run 35 inches per minute. It'll, it, it buzzes right through it like butter. If I'm using an eighth inch bit, I run it down to about 25 inches a minute. And if I'm running a ah. straight cut bit on aluminum, that bad boy's down to about 10 inches a minute, as high RPM as I can. Yeah, a lot of it's like personal preference on what you know what you want your finished side to be. Um, you know, if, and if it's going to tear it up, um, or if you want that side to be. Uh. You know, the facing side for, you know, like for instance, in, you know, making the little, the sprinter van camping, like, you know, you'll want the outside parts to be, um, whether depending on how your orientation, your cut is like, if it's, you know, if, if it's, if you're doing like an upcut bit or something like that, well, that's maybe if your front facing is against your wasteboard, you know, and then vice versa, if it's swapped, well, then that's when you'd be doing your down cut. So then you have like one nice edge and then one nice one edge that's kind of blown out. 
basically. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then you fine. have to, you know, like sand down and stuff and it won't look as good. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I, you know, I know it's like I said, it's not, it's not like waving a wand and it does it all for you. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I've got some woodwork experience, but yeah, I'm just quite excited by the whole idea of being able to do whatever I want really. And awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah. Now they say a compression bit won't blow out, but a, it does, and B, it gets hot, so it, you have to slow your speeds down. So, you know, it's just more beer time while you're watching your CNC work. But yeah, how yeah, whatever I'm go, I'm go, the is. I'm, at some stage, I'm gonna when we get to get it going and everything, I'm gonna have to have sort of a chat with you guys about um, running speeds and 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 stuff like that, so I can get that right and and how I can tell whether I'm going too fast or too slow. Um, so yeah, we. We'll, we'll, I, I, when I get to that, so I'm a little bit down the road. I need to get the frame built first, but yeah, I've, um, yeah, for yeah. sure. Like, like we want to work with with all of y'all to figure out all those different things because everybody uses different um, different settings and different things that work for them. Different routers of different RPMs and all that kind of stuff. So we want to try to. That's one of the things that we've actually identified in our like FAQ is working on like different materials that you're using, what kind of bits you would use, what kind of speeds you would use, how deep you would cut. You know what. And, and to, to really help with everybody to build that out together so we can all build all those resources and kind of like a knowledge base of all the information that everybody's using. So we kind of have it all in one space. That's something that, that we're working on to try to, to make it easier to find that information for everybody. Mm -hmm. Cause it's hard to find it in like the Facebook group and stuff like that, or in the Maslow forums or something like it's, it's out there, but it's, you got to kind of like dig it around. So we're trying to work on consolidating all of it for sure. Just one other thing as well, I've mentioned, uh, Drew, um, when, when we got the M2 and everything and the, and the disc and everything, it, why don't you make a like, little circle that plugs into the middle hole with a centre hole in it, which is exactly the width of the, the bits that you supply when you buy the M2, then you could just put that in, locate it, get it absolutely spot on. Um, I was going to make one when I first did it and then yeah. uh, you then, then sort of do, upload a template. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that we have that as like a that, that you can cut, you can cut one or we have a 3D printed file, but yeah, that's that's definitely something that, um, that's a really good idea. Um, yeah. and, and we've heard that before to try to make sure that you get it exactly in the center of that circle, uh, yeah. for sure. Okay. Yeah. Yep, so you got one for quarter inch and one for eighth inch. I just pop them in there, put the bit in, slide the router in, and I always know it's centered. You are star, that's exactly what I was gonna do. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not as uh, crazy as I thought. I was trying to explain to my brother he couldn't get his head around it, but yeah. Yeah, sweet. All right. Thank so you. We got some more questions. Yeah, you bet, Tim. Laura, I see you got your hand raised. You got a question, man? No, I'm just going to give some quick feedback because, uh, I mean, sure. I've got my wife has a sign business and then she drafted me. And so I've done a significant amount of time cutting a lot of just simple names and things like that. Um, and with that in mind, I've, uh, tried everything from the cheapest of bits because I tend to be a very frugal person to the, the very high grade bits. And from my experience, you get what you pay for. My best experience so far has been with a company called Tools Today. Um, yeah, and they make some pretty high quality bits uh, that have done a very good job. Uh, they're, I think it's called a finishing bit, a quarter inch finishing bit. And then you can also get an eighth inch um, all the way down to MDF. It does some very clean cuts, but you get what you pay for. Yeah. Oh, you muted. You muted, Lauren. I missed you. There you go. What'd you say? I missed that last part. Can you still hear me? I'm sorry. There you go. I hear you now. Yeah, muted. There you go. Sorry. I got a call, a call in. Sorry, I'm at work right now. But <laughs> yes, the the uh, tools today makes a lot of finishing bits and some high grade. They're, like I said, you pay for it. Um, yeah. To get, but they also make one of the best things that I invested in is they make a uh, mini roundover bits and mini fin or, uh, flush trim bits. So if you're running your eighth inch uh, cutting bits, they'll actually get in. They have a tiny little bearing on them, um, so you can get all the way in and you can clean those burrs up or anything like that that comes off. Because uh, we ran into that, I was like, I'm I'm tired of a cut lasting thirty minutes, and then <laughs> I spend the next two hours cleaning up the cut just because it you know it can make a mess. Yeah, uh, so, so it's it like a little bearing the, on the end. The, the time. Yeah. It's like a bearing on the end of the bit. Do what? Sorry. It's like a bearing on the yeah, end. Yeah, so of the if you look up, you like swap the bit out, and then it does like the final cut with that. Yeah, so it, exactly, oh, it's cool. just it's just a flush trim, but they're I think the the bearing is less than three sixteenth of an inch. It's closer to eighth of an inch. It's a very small bearing. But it'll just kind um, of pull out all the all the sawdust. Oh yeah. And stuff. 
stuff that's in there. That's how much is that bit? Uh, you can get a, a combo kit for I think a hundred dollars for a chamfer, a, two roundovers, and a flush trim bit off of the tools today. Like I said, they're not cheap, but they're actually pretty high quality. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, if they work and the, you know they don't break, then um, that's good. That's awesome. I mean, so far so good. I've used them for about twenty or more cuts or so. The only thing is, is uh, my wife does a lot of the signs out of MDF. So keep a keep a bowl of hot water, and about every ten cuts or so, you want to dip the bit in the hot water for about five minutes, and then just wipe it off, and the glue and the residue comes right off. It's just it's one of those things it builds up when you're cutting plywood and MDF. A lot of that residue it just like sticks to it. Yeah. Right. On. Just, have, just have interest, Lauren. Um, you, you say you, your wife does signs yeah, and everything else. It, yeah, has that been a viable business? Is she making money out of it? Is she doing well out of it? Or? So uh, I'm full-time military, and so I didn't really expect it to take off. And we started it in the like March, April of last year. And I swore, like I kind of laughed and said it wasn't going to do anything. I was like, nobody can afford this kind of stuff. I strongly underestimated the amount of spouses that sit at home during COVID and how much they are willing to spend on decorations. Uh, yeah, so definitely. To put it in perspective, like I'm not, we just kind of just, it's just a Facebook market business at this point. And in the last 12 months, we've, the net income has been about, uh, I want a rough 15K for the first That's year. That's though, do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's like a side gig. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's so, exactly what like we're said, doing. Not, I mean, that pays for everything. That pays for all the tools and the bits and the wood and, and plus some on top of that. So that's awesome. Right. So, like, what, yeah, what? if you if you want to look it up and like, I'm by no means, we're just, we just started winging it if you really want to know the truth. Like there wasn't no like, I mean, I've got some decent business savvy, but it wasn't anything serious. Um, <laughs> but like, if you're going to invest in cleanup materials, because whether you like it or not, Every CNC, because I've messed with CNCs in the past, you're going to have to do cleanup. None of them's perfect, uh, but invest in a quality spindle sander. Um, I have the rigid one. Invest in a Dremel. Invest in the things because your cleanup is going to always be longer than your cut, in my experience. Yeah. And I even took, I don't know if you watch uh, Adam Savage on YouTube, but you can buy the, yeah. uh, what do you call them? The files for fingernails. I ended up making my own out of sandpaper. They significantly decrease cleanup time, just running over your edges with a little file, and it takes the burrs off real quick for anything that the machine can't clean up. Hmm. Nice, yeah, that's an awesome tip. Especially if you're making like decorations and stuff indoor, like that finishing, that's like the most important part. So, yeah. and also a uh, 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 planer is good too. A planer and a joiner is always hundred percent, hundred percent. The cleaner your material is before you start, the better it'll turn out. Oh, yeah, most definitely. That's 100%. So what, just have interest, what sort of things are you guys making? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm just talking about this. I've got other ideas, but um, signs obviously work quite well. Um, I was looking at things like, I don't know if you have these out there, radiator covers. They seem to so sell we, really well. So we've done everything to include furniture, like you name it. It's just our most our most lucrative by far is the signs. And nine times out of 10, what, you, what we found is most people want something. They just don't know how to get it done. And they don't want to, they, they're done with the Ikea game. That's where our game is at is they've gone, they played the Ikea route and now they're tired of that furniture. And they're like, hey, I'm ready to spend a little bit more money for an upgrade. Exactly. And they'll pay. Um, and then that's where we step in. And there's only been a few occasions where I'm like, look, because uh, I don't do furniture that includes cushioning. I know how to do it, but it's not worth my time. It's not. But if it's any kind of just solid wood furniture, if it's signs or if it's anything, it's just it's I have to give them the honest assessment. It's going to take me this many hours to do it. And that was the greatest thing about the CNC is it's free unpaid labor is what it is for me. <laughs> Let's get the robot to do it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. The last thing I would mention, if you haven't done it yet, I don't know if there's a way to show pictures on here. I apologize for my ignorance, but. Uh, um, yeah, I can, I can give you ability if you want to share. Yeah. Uh, but I was going to share because I was going to do it last week. There you go. Because I know. I don't think I'm seeing. Or similar. <laughs> um, is. There you go. You should be able sorry, to share. Oh, well. 
Down there on the bottom, you should be able to hit like share screen and then you can share it. Yeah, it's just not showing. I wonder if I can hit it in the chat. Yeah. Either way, I'll figure it out in a minute. But long story short, if you do it and you search on Amazon or you go into like we go to Walmart here, uh, buy the two and a half pound plates from Walmart or on Amazon. They're just cap is the is the brand, C A P plates, the weighted plates. Okay. They're one inch in okay. diameter and replace those instead of your bricks. It has paid me huge dividends yeah. on getting yeah. down low and a controlling and, and it's just, it's so much more compact of a, of a system. Um, and all you do is basically just get a one inch dowel, drill a hole through it. And now instead of having the bricks and the multiple clamps and everything, plus I also ran into problems, me being clumsy or my wife not paying attention or whatever. What uh, is it called? They're just weighted plates. I want to see if I can. I'll, I'll let yeah, I would love to know what that is. Yeah, yeah so would I. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, oh. just weighted, like lifting this plates. Is, this is really good. This um, is really good. Because that's one of the things that we've talked about too is like, you know, we say bricks because that's the easiest, you know, thing that for you to find and source, but it's the weight really that it needs to hold down for the gravity. And we can't really ship it with the kit because then that makes it crazy expensive to ship. So like, that's why that becomes like one of the things to DIY. So, um, yeah. I quite, like, I, I quite like the fact that it's all DIY and the fact you've got to do, that's the whole idea of it. You're getting half the kit, the excitement of building it, making it, making it work. That's the bit that you, that's, that's the, the fun. fun that's the fun part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least for me. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I, I also in the past have built in, built, um, uh, what we call them ply axe, which is basically shapes cut out of um, six mil, three mil plywood. Yeah. Um, and then you can stitch them together like um, and epoxy them. And then you've got a kayak, you can make a kayak. And I've made, I don't know, about four or five of these now. And, and um, awesome. yeah, they're really, really, yeah, brilliant idea. And, and the fact that I always have struggled getting, because I always did it with jigsaw or something. So I always struggled with them. Um, but there you go, fine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that looks good. You see, what I, I mean, you can kind of see what I'm talking about there. It's yeah. just yeah. Uh, you buy the they're two and a half pound plates. I bought three of them or total of six. My sled weighs in at about twenty six and a half to twenty seven pounds total weight. Yeah. Um. And, and yeah. It, it, I found it is so much more compact. It doesn't bump things. Doesn't scratch things. And it's just I mean you can, it's just I just took the wing nut side, and it's an easy clamp. So if I do something like my that's all I do. Yeah. And you got them in the center too. So it's like pulling the center of gravity down. So it's not, you know, like rocking side to side. So exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. Hmm, nice. Sweet. Lauren, Sorry, have you got took a, a minute? To, yeah. yeah took a you, minute to get that. Have you got a 12, 12 foot beam or have you got a 10 foot beam on top of those, that cutter? So I actually only have a, I can actually share you the, the full picture. I only got the 10 foot beam. Um, fine, yeah. And what I realized is, I can go all the way to the edge relatively comfortably. Um, when you balance the, this was a hard lesson learned for my first few cuts. <laughs> when you balance your chains, right? From the outside of your rig, right? So they're going up because it goes in that ring. What I did to get it, finally get it right because the bricks and your weights at the bottom are your counterbalance. So what I did was actually lower the bit all the way down to where it's sticking out well beyond the bottom of your rig. And then I balance the sled on that bit. So where when it balances oh, on that, okay. even when it gets to the edge, it doesn't flop over. Cause I've gone over the edge and it won't move cause it's balanced on that center point. So like a top, if that makes sense. So when you, when you got your change lined up, you had it pulled out. So then when your change lined up, it was, it was like, bounce for your ring so you moved your ring like up and down too to line it up with your your sprockets and all exactly that. so yeah so I what i realized is i made that mistake that. is I just extend that bit down and it if it if it's centered if it when it's sitting still if that bit if that plate is sticking out all the way around and it's not touching and it's just balanced on your bit then you know that it is going to be balanced so i've cut now i also made the mistake the other day i was like oh i can maximize my cut right because uh, MDF, as many of y'all know, it's one inch longer and wider than regular plywood, or at least here in the States it is. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I'll cut past the edge. Well, the machine, and this is a question that I have for later in the meeting, is ground control won't let you go beyond the edge. 
Um, so it goes up to the edge and then it just cut it off. Even though I had a full inch left to go in the cut, it just told me no and said, you're not going beyond that. So it was like a lesson learned. No big deal. I did it, you know, I had plenty more wood, but it was just kind of like, oh, that stinks. Yeah. And ground control, it's not supported anymore. So it's pretty, it's getting out of date. Um, and then it hasn't been updated in a while. So um, it's not going to get updated. Yeah. I, I think it's done. Isn't it? It's done. Yeah. I think Mike, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's done. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. We're moving into Makerverse. Well, see, if, if you got a chance, I do have a question about that. Because I downloaded Makerverse, but I don't have the updated. I'm waiting till for another couple of months before I buy the upgrade kit. Mm -hmm. You can do it with uh, your Maslow. You can. It, it, it's, it's, it says it's connected to the port, but it is not registering in any way. Like, I can't click any of the buttons. I can't do anything with it. And I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or if yeah, this just, is a common just, issue. Just send me a message on support at um, makerme.com and then just send me your information, your phone number, and then I'll get with you. And you can just send me screenshots. Okay. Yeah, you yeah, can put uh, it in the private chat. Yeah. You can put your email in the private chat too. And then um, Mike or I'll reach out to you. Probably Mike, he's quicker than me. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's just one of those, that was one of the challenges I faced here is I was like, I wanted to, to take part in a lot of these, but uh, it's kind of the middle of my work day. So yeah, that was my yeah. biggest challenge. For sure. Cool. Thank you. I, yeah, have, you I have a question if I could. Yeah. How's it going, uh, Mike? I'm just making my frame right now. Uh, I make a metal frame and in my shop, uh, I have too much junk. And so it's portable. Um, I've got a 12 inch top bar. I'm 12 inch, 12 foot top bar. Okay. How high above that do I have to be above the, the top of the four by eight sheet? 24 inches, I believe. I think 24 inches is the magic number. Is, is that right, Matt, Mike? Uh, excuse me. Sorry about that. I was answering an email. Say it again. Um, uh, 24 inches for the top beam of the for 12 foot for your uh, your motor offset. I think yeah, 24 that's... inches is your 24. Number. Sounds good. Yeah. So it's got to be a little bit more than your um, than the 10 foot. So the 10 foot yeah. is like um, uh, yeah, eight, uh, 18. 18. And I think what, what Casey was talking about a couple weeks ago he was talking about is like two inches for each one and like moving it up there. Um, to to get like the math correct um which i don't know the math to that so uh but, but yeah it, it's it's about 24 inches um and it's better to be a little bit taller than it is to be a little bit like too close well, my, my top beam is adjustable will be adjustable so i can move it in and out the problem is is that is that it's too high to get out my garage door when it when it's up at 24 inches i mean i can i can drop it down it's just a pain to I think it'll be a pain to readjust every time I move it in and out. So I was hoping that I could get right at 24, but. So you can, if you want to try to cut in your garage, you could use like a curtain or something like that to try to like, um, kind of go around it. Um, or well, it's in my shop. Much. I have full dust collection and everything. Okay. So, okay. so it's, you know, but my shop is just full of other stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Could you rig it up to where you could, it could maybe lean? Like maybe, like there's a- I, I thought about that, putting like, putting some excess wheels so I could lean it over and pull it out and put it back in. But I, I don't know. I, I, I might find out that I just use it there a lot or I might put it somewhere else. I don't know. I don't know yet. Yeah, for, for the 12 foot, yeah, it, it helps to be that that far up. So um so there's got to be, yeah, some sort of some sort of way where you can move it in and out without having to like constantly adjust it and then uh, back and forth. Right. Be, be well, that's assuming that I didn't. Could you make it instead of? Could you set it up for uh, for uh, like a three by eight instead of a four by eight sheet? Yeah, yeah. You can change. You can change it. Uh, you can you can totally change like the size of it. But then you're gonna have to cut your like four by eight material and stuff. So like if you don't want to do your twelve foot beam, if you want to do something smaller. Um, uh, you know, you can, you can definitely adjust that. Well, like, you wouldn't have to six. cut it. You would just cut out of a, the lower spot of the board. Does that make, am I making sense in what I'm saying, yeah. Casey? Yeah. So if you yeah. have, if you have like here, I have double skirts on mine. So I have a skirt at the top, bottom and ends. And I do too. If you want, if you want to do a full four by eight. So here's the trick. If you want to just have a 10 foot beam. You can have a 10 foot beam and still cut a full four by eight, but the bottom, 
corners, probably about the bottom foot by foot, 12 by 12 on the bottom corners, your, the M2 becomes very inaccurate. And you can see that because when you run the machine down to that very bottom corner, like this chain right here becomes slack whenever it gets way down there in that bottom corner. So to offset that, a simple fix is take your two skirts off your ends so you can put your four by eight up there, but you can slide it back and forth. So you can literally slide it this way a little bit. So your end of the board is right here. Go ahead and make whatever cuts, take your board and slide it this way and then make some more cuts. And then you don't have to cut your four by eight. Instead, you're just taking out four yeah. screws and sliding your board side to side. And then you can still utilize like that whole space and you're not wasting that's the material. Right. And, yeah, that's the way, that's the way I do it. it. It's the simplest way. I don't, I don't like to have to break out a skill saw and cut my wood down. I mean, what the hell? Yeah, me neither. Getting a four by eight CNC if you have to cut your wood anyway. <laughs> kind of crazy. Uh, well, I, I, I wouldn't cut it. I would just, just use the bottom uh, three feet of the board. Yeah, does, that, does what I'm saying make sense? You know, instead yeah, of sure. just saying, I, I'll give up the top foot so I don't have to lower my top beam. Yeah. It, one thing that would be kind of tricky though is to figure out if you're going to do that, you'd have to change your like top waistboard measurement, like your well, that, that was my question. Yeah. yeah, so you'd probably need to to like use a level um, to to like draw a line and measure to that line. Right. Um, basically, you're tricking the program into thinking that's the top of your wasteboard. Correct. Um, so, yeah, you can totally do that for sure. Okay. And, you know, uh, a question Tim had earlier, what, what are people making with it, right? Um, so, the C, so the M2, I know that they say if you get under six millimeters, you're, you're or under six millimeters in accuracy, it's pretty good, right? I get mine down to about 2.2 millimeters accuracy. It took, takes a good half a day to get it dialed in. But once it's dialed in, you can make stuff like this. So I don't know if you guys can see this. This is a, a desk, a computer desk. Oh, you sweet. Can see the finger joints. Look at that thing. Smooth, beautiful. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. Yeah. And so so, so when, you, when, when you do the finger joints, do you do uh, the bone? Um, sort of end to it because obviously when you cut in from an angle you got curved so you've got to do the bone joint yeah so i would i would suggest people do the dog bones right and in easel there's a dog bone generator me i don't like the dog bones because i don't like that little cutout left in my furniture i like it nice and tight so whenever you're looking at like this i don't know if you guys can see those see there's no yeah. dog bone right here yeah yeah yeah, you can double click on this picture too if you want to. If you want a full screen, um, so yeah. zip it. <laughs> you guys can see it there. Yeah. It's like the literally, literally, I'm a glutton for punishment. So whenever I cut these, I cut them square, and then I use a hand file. Should... All right. And I go in and I square up. I square those up. Yeah. So it's it's more work, but I mean the furniture looks beautiful. No. That's that. So that's what that's what because I was that's what I was asking about the dog bone thing is, is what alternatives are there. Uh, but you've answered that. Yeah, and uh, and for those, believe it or not, for this whole thing, I used a quarter inch bit. I didn't use a one eighth because I can use a quarter inch bit as long as I can square those corners up. It cuts my mill time down considerably. Yeah. Now, like this desk here, like I said, this is a hobby for me. So this is a it's a computer desk. I'm giving it away, but it's just something for me to do to get out of the house and get away from work and everything. So I'm more than willing to sit there with a file for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sweet. I'm glad I'm not the only one OCD enough to do that every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, the little dog bones drive me nuts. And I know you can do the offset. So in easel, if you choose your drawing and then you go in and you apply the dog bones to your outline. You can actually change the offset of those dog bones. So I actually took a piece of wood and I made uh, a bunch of little squares in it and I changed the offset for each one to see which one I liked the best. And I think it's a 0.2 offset in there. That's decent enough 
And I guess if you don't mind putting some wood filler in them or something like that after you cut them, it'd be just, it'd still be really nice looking. But it's just the point that I just didn't like those. So that's just me. However you want to do it. You're um, muted. Yes, I know. <laughs> Are you, have you tried any parametric? parametric furniture um, so that's use so that's using the plywood in the vertical and then cutting a shape into it so you have lots it's it's, it's, a, it's a wasteful sort of way of doing it but effectively you get these mad seats and so i just wonder if anybody's done what they call parametric using plywood or mdf sort of shapes no yeah so you cut what you do is you'll end up and remember this is a mill it doesn't carve it mills no so what you're going to have to do, like I'm working, I have another piece for our pool out here. It is actually an S-shaped uh, chair, lounge chair, but it, oop, but it folds in half into itself, right? But what you have to do is cut multiple shapes of the same yeah. size, right? And then I'm putting a, a one inch wood dowel that goes all the way through it. So all the fingers fold up into themselves whenever you want it to fold flat. I guess you just oh. have to work around it, but you know, you have to either know, um, 360, you know, a lot of people love 360. I'm a, I'm a Google SketchUp brat. Sketch up, yeah. sketch up. <laughs> so I, I put a video out there on how to take a drawing, create it, uh, flip it to 2d yeah. and then get it into, um, uh, maker verse. So there's a video out there that shows people how to do that too. I'm not at that stage yet. I'm using Shaper 3D on my iPad and that's quite good. I can do all sorts of things, but I haven't even got to the point of like exporting it and, and stuff like that. But uh, when I get to that stage, I'll be back on it. <laughs> yeah, this, this is great. This is fantastic, y'all. Does anybody have any questions? We're working on their setup. Matt, I see you got the, I got your email, but I didn't have a chance to respond. So you, you got logged in. Good to see you, man. Yep. Hey, thanks. Um, I have a question. Uh, the the stuff on the on the USB. You have some uh, you have some files on there, like the Moose project. Um, how big is the uh, is the wood supposed to be on some of those advanced ones? Is it is it half inch or or, or quarter inch? So I haven't made any of those. Um, so I'm not sure. Cause the, so those were on there. Those are from the old, I think from Maslow garden. I think there's some of those on there. So you can adjust them, I think, to fit um, whatever size you want is. And if you scale it, I think that they'll stay the same. Um, okay. They should stay kind of the, the, the same markings. Some of them are made, it depends for like a certain thickness of wood, but it should say if it's it, on it there. doesn't it like i was looking at the they're just svg files and and mm -hmm. i was trying to figure out how you know how wide those are and i loaded it in um in in um easel and i just couldn't figure i couldn't determine if it was half or a quarter inch so i'll, I'll take a look some more i'm yeah, not sure user, that's all user um it depends on what you want you know what i mean it, 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 it all depends on your preference you know what do you want you can use it on 3d basically svg you have to put it into easel or into a software like they were saying, and then you convert the toolpath and you tell the program what size of thickness is your material, what size, what bit you're using, how fast you want it to go, and what. Yeah, but it, it looked like these were like tabs at a specific size. Yeah. Okay. So hold on, guys. The the moose one that you're talking about, I looked at it. I haven't cut it yet. Yeah. Oh Remember, the moose one is an interlocking. Yeah. Joint, right. Yeah. So the tabs. So the tabs at the of those joints. Is going to be how thick your wood needs to be. I know, but I couldn't measure it accurately, or I don't know how to an easel. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Okay, you, so how do you do a distance? Well, so, you got to put it down. I don't know how to do it in lots of other zero. programs, but you got to put so, it down zero zero in easel, and then yeah, zoom right way in, and it'll break your measurements out along the bottom. Okay. And remember, wood. Uh, is by eight. So buying anything at your local hardware is going to be closest to the ne to the nearest sixteenth. So that's what I would do. Is I would just zoom in there, look at the closest sixteenth, and that's what I would buy my wood. Okay. At. All right. Sounds good. Bye. Yeah, that's a great uh, tip, Casey, from someone who's uh, more advanced in woodworking than I am. Is that like if you're doing tabs and that's the same as the as your thickness, thickness of your material, that's smart. That's a that's a great tip. That's awesome. I, uh, my shop vac <laughs> burned out from running so long being on attached to the, the m2 so i'm building a new um 
shop vac cart with the dust separator. And I made this in, in oh, uh, cool. easel. So I was like, I could, nice. cut yeah. out, I could cut this out with my woodworking tools, but I'm like, I got a, I have a freaking CNC. Why don't I CNC this? So I made, I made a, you know, a top, a top thing for my dust cart. And so I'm, I'm priming it and then I'm going to paint it here after that. Awesome. I'm pretty excited about that. Not excited. My shop vac burned out, but you know, <laughs> I mean, it's still, yeah, it's still cool. It's a, it's an excuse to make a project. <laughs> yeah. With the fine dust, the, the M2 really creates really, really fine dust. So Mm -hmm. Trying to just use a shop vac without a pre-cyclone or something like that, you're just going to burn your shop vac up. Yeah, you got it. You have to have a yeah. On it. Do not. Do, oh, you're breaking up, Drew. Yeah, do not just use a shop vac. Not only that, for time, we had shop vac. Do not use a shop vac. <laughs> you're, you can go to Harbor Fairly Nice, uh, like. A uh, forty-gallon dust um, collector. It's a it's yeah. I have gallon. a dust collector for mine, like uh, like this guy right here. I got a big old one. Uh, Shop vac motor. The motors aren't designed to run for hours. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some cheap ones on Amazon too awesome. that aren't bad. Harbor Freight. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. But, yeah, if you run a shop vac for hours, you're gonna burn the shop vac up. Collection as well. Um, I, I, have any of you looked at this website by Bill Pence, P-E-N-T-Z? He's got a bunch of stuff on dust collection, and I got to say, it's it's kind of alarming to me. He's saying that getting sawdust uh, cleaned up is one thing, but fine dust is is a lot more uh, cubic feet per minute. Um, if if 350 cubic feet per minute is okay for sawdust, you need a thousand cubic feet per minute to get the really fine dust, which is what damages your lungs. Uh, are any of you familiar with that stuff? Have you seen that? I made one of his units. Okay. Oh, you did? Works, yeah. Works fine. Yeah, so let me, I'll, I'll show you here real quick what I did, was it's the same thing. Here's my dust collection. I get probably 90% of the dust that comes off of this. I'm getting ready to insulate, and actually the guys are here going to put in air conditioning and everything in my shop you need to collect most of that dust so I have this it's going to a, a dust collector there that is right at 1100 cfm and then on top of that up here on the ceiling that catches my one micron and that thing I run that that is it's actually I calculated that now it'll change out the air in my in my shop nine times an hour Okay, so, you know, for do, people do you, that what do you have? Do you have anything to measure dust in the air? Do you do you do anything with with measuring it? I don't measure it. No, my the sh between, well, the the shop fox, my filter there catches everything down to two point five microns, and anything that gets outside of that dust collection system, I I built into the Maslow, my overhead system catches everything all the way down to one micron. Now I can sit out here and I can have a drink or whatever. I don't get dust in the air. I don't, you know, I don't, I, you don't get all clogged up. That's the big deal. And One thing to do too is if you, like in here, uh, like right now, we've obviously not been doing a good job in these, in these warehouses with our, these are our woodworking warehouses. But so if you drop, if you drop a cigarette on the floor and your shop goes up in flames, you know, you probably, it's time to vacuum dust. That's what we've been doing. Yeah. Hopefully it's before that point, Drew. <laughs> well, I, I also got to preempt that a little bit, man. <laughs> I got a, a couple more questions. I I I have not yet bought a uh, an M2. I'm I'm looking at it pretty seriously, and I'm trying to understand what I need to set up. I I want to ask: Are are all of you doing attended operation, or you walk away from it, or you monitor by video in another room? How, how bad is the noise and, and the dust and so on? And do you feel you need to be there for fire safety or whatever? <laughs> I'm going to let everybody answer this. I'm going yeah. I'm I'm to answer this one first because I did catch my M1 on fire. And luckily, and I'd gone home. And so um, luckily what had happened, so the M2 is a lot better um, system, but the M1, my router had slipped a little, a little catching and the Z-axis jammed and it just kept trying to drag it into the wood. And so I use the little $25 wise cams 
that you can see here. They're 25 bucks. They're great actual cameras. They're really good cameras. And I have them all over my shop, but these little cameras. And luckily I had it, so I'd monitor it. And I was like, man, my, our warehouse, because uh, at that point I had it in our big, like 10, uh, big 10,000 square foot warehouse over here. And I was looking at it and uh, this, this has got 28 foot ceilings. And I was like, and so uh, I was like, man, there's a, uh, uh, so it takes a lot of smoke to fill this thing up. Or the, I was like, man, it looks so foggy. What's going on with the camera? And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> I, luckily I'm not too far from the, where, uh, from, I live, uh, and luckily, yeah, it, it, it burned up the backboard, stuff like that. But um, so we, now with M2s, I feel more comfortable, but, um, but I still would put a camera on it and not be, definitely do not go home and, if unless you're like five minutes from it. You know what I mean? For me, that's I, my recommendation, just in case. For me, I run it. I stay within the vicinity. I see it. I watch it. Now that doesn't mean I don't go in the house and grab something or whatever, and then come back out. That it doesn't. Yeah. It's okay to do that. But again, it's a machine. If you leave it unattended, shame on you. <laughs> yeah. The so, other thing too is, if you want, they are pretty loud. Like, because we have we have twenty two thousand square feet over here, and we have. Uh, so my front office is up there. I have a bunch of front offices I sublease um, on the on the side of the building where I have the mouse right now. And the other day they were complaining, they were, one of the office people was claiming because the front conference room, which is a good sixty feet away um, and through several walls, including um, including firewalls, uh, they could hear it. And so um, I, one thing I have is I really been meaning to do is I have, so I have a bunch of water chillers, big old industrial water chillers. And so I've been meaning to put water, um, you can put water cooled spindles on there, which will make a huge difference over the routers. And then plus you can have speed control too, because the new M2 has PWM on it. So if you want to make it silent, you can get a nice um, water cooled or even some um, cheaper air cooled for um, 200 to 400 bucks. Yeah, we don't recommend leaving it unattended. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh because it is it's different than like a 3d printer so like i'll leave stuff printing for like a week and and just check on it every now and then and you can't do that with an m2 yeah. or a Mac because it's it's a router um so and it's it's moving stuff around it's literally cutting wood so you, you like going inside or going to the bathroom or something like that like uh, you know i'll leave it cutting and go in the other room and maybe hang out and even if you're gone for 10 minutes or something like uh, I don't even like doing that. I like to like do, co go and then come back and still be in the vicinity and be around it because you'll hear if something goes wrong. It'll make some crazy noises. Noise, yes. uh, and, and you'll know. Uh, you'll know that something, um, either a bit is broken or something's jammed or so something has gone terribly wrong. Um, or if it loses the connection, that's another thing that can be really frustrating is like if your computer goes asleep then and it's Probably getting connection from it, then it'll just sit there and then your cuts failed and then it'll just like spin in that one place over and over and over again. And you wouldn't know that if you weren't attending it and watching it. Um, one so other thing, to be safe, is, I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the one that, uh, that jammed on us, it did cause the wood to smoke like crazy or anything else. And it did start a little bit far, but the thing did not go up on flame. It did not go completely up in flames. And it was uh, over an hour before. And that was it a Maslow. Like that. Too, yeah, and that was, that was setting pretty high, uh, <clears> high speed <throat> setting. So, I mean, but the other thing to do is I, if you buy a fire extinguisher, I always keep fire extinguishers by them just in case. I always keep yes. fire extinguishers by all our equipment. But uh, the other big thing is make sure you have, uh, get the fire extinguishers that are powered. Do not get regular fire extinguishers. Get equipment safe fire extinguishers. They sell them at Home Depot and stuff. They're like 40 bucks. But if you spray a regular fire, fire extinguisher, yeah. you're going to your fry your equipment. See you, Matt. Yeah. See you yeah. guys. Yeah, Eric, I see you've had your hand raised. You can just butt in, man. We're just talking. Yeah. If you got a question, man. <laughs> yeah i just got an m2 awesome. um, i just got it put together i actually ordered the 3d printer too i pretty much ordered everything you guys sell in one awesome. shot um that's great man so last night i just got the m2 all put together i did the calibration and did all that it won't link to easel no matter what i do like i was hours trying to get it to link to the point where i was going to smash it with a hammer and I said, I should go to bed. <laughs> what do you mean link to easel? Do you mean like- Come again? Come again? Do you plug... your decode from easel or what do you mean link to easel? Like when you plug it in and it, once you get your file in easel and then uh, you can 
it has like click okay. to carve or whatever. Yeah. It, it does oh yeah, you'll, you'll export your file and you'll open it and use and uh, and and Makerverse. You have to actually. Um, it does a uh, the Makerverse does not connect with Easel. You actually have to outport uh, uh, to send out your file. Export it to Makerverse. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Eric. Eric, just again, I have a video on the Facebook page where I take something from Google SketchUp and I put yep. it into Easel. I take it out of Easel and then I put it into Makerverse. And it's literally a, re a screen record. You could see me click this, click this, do this, do this. That'll show you how to get your whatever you have in Easel pulled out and put into Makerverse so it'll connect to your machine. All right. If you have any trouble, so just send us a message. To, uh, support yeah. it. Yeah, we're having a good one because Eagles for Shape Ocos, um, and it and it doesn't it doesn't connect to the do board that we have. So can, can uh, I? All right. Well, then that would explain why it wasn't connecting. <laughs> can I jump in and ask? <laughs> yeah, you know, so many different mills, stuff like yeah. that. Even if they have integration, like with the Crossfire stuff like that, I don't do that. I usually export and then go straight into the CAM system itself. Instead of a lot of times, you don't want to go from like. You don't want to use this direct export or direct um, connect tool. So I, I just have issues with them sometimes. So a lot of times, and it, it, it sometimes doesn't open the right profiles or anything else. So can Somebody I have a question and, and ask what people are using for their tool path? I gather Makerverse is kind of the uh, the the recommended direction for tool path generation. What are people using upstream? I hear SketchUp. I hear Easel. Easel is really good if you're learning and stuff. But Fusion 360 and Easel are two main go-to's. Yeah, uh, Easel is a great one for beginners. It's awesome um, to start with, and you can do tons of stuff in there. Um, and you can, you know, uh, even starting from scratch, just making stuff. You can import anything that's an SVG into Easel um, to generate your toolpath. And so for me, it's a quick rule of thumb. If I'm doing something technical, it's furniture or something like that, then I'll go to SketchUp. Right or 360, you know, you, you need a CAD, a CAD drawing system for that. If I'm taking a, a picture I got from the internet or an SVG file or something like that that I'm downloading, I put that straight into Easel. Yeah. Easel will load those. So if you're making signs and things like that, and uh, you know that that kind of stuff, you can load all that right into right into Easel and then take it from Easel and adjust it and then put it right into Makerverse. But if it's a technical, something technical, furniture or desks, whatever it may be, then I'm drawing it. I'm designing it. I do that in 360 or, or in uh, SketchUp. So the other things you can do too, it's interesting. So um, sometimes I'll do, we do a lot of Illustrator too for certain things, but mostly for our laser cutters and everything. But you can actually take stuff from, you can export SVGs, stuff like that. And you can take them over and use them also. Um, you won't have depth uh, per se, but if you were just doing, there's things you can do if you want to take them, if you were doing Illustrator also. And so, uh, and then Lightburn, if uh, people have worked out there with Lightburn, I'm testing direct integration with Lightburn right now. Uh, with the, okay. and it does Lightburn immediately recognizes the maker mates, the, uh, the V2s and everything without a problem. Yeah, but that would be for laser stuff. So. Well, and, and just to be clear, so, is, is the tool path generated in Makerverse or in Easel? No. E still creates the tool. Path. It's 12 o'clock. Okay. Can I jump in with a question? Yeah, absolutely, Harold. Yeah. Um, I'm we'll thinking about buying an M2 and I want to um, do our full, full size arcade cabinets. How far can this thing cut out to the edge of the sheet with still being accurate? Oh, if you buy the extended chains, you can get all the way up to 10 feet. You can get 12 feet actually with the extended chains. So you can do you can do actually pretty darn big. So I would look at the extended chains and then do a 12 foot top beam. To do the four by eight sheet of plywood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and oh yeah, you can you can still with, with base one you can do a full four by eight. But if I would recommend if you're doing full size stuff, when you buy the M2, go ahead and get the extended chain set. It's not that much. I think it's like an extra 30, 40 bucks, something like that. I don't know. Drew would know that one. And then um, get a 12 foot or 16 foot top beam as cool. my recommendation. And that way you just, you don't have anything. And it also gives you room for jigging them. So if you want to, if you're putting pieces in there four by eights, you can do jigs. So you can set up a nice jigging system really easy with it for that. Nice. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, and you can do like a skirt system like Casey's done too to help you get all the way to the edges so it doesn't it doesn't run off the side um, or anything else either as you're going like all the way to the edges. It's, it's very modular. So um, you can, I, I know people who build arcade cabinets. I've, I, I've heard of people doing that before on them. So you can, you can absolutely cut them out um, on full sheet ply. That's, that's the whole point of Maslow, which is the M2 is all built on that tech is to be able to do that full space. So, okay. Excellent. Yeah, but it's, de it's definitely worth it. If you're talking about what you're doing, get, get, go ahead. And when you buy it, buy the extra chain set or buy the extended chain set. You'll, 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 you'll be glad you had it. Especially if you, when you get to first set it up, you might as well just set it up with that from the beginning. It'll make your life so much easier. Because if you have an extra like two feet on each side to make a really nice mounting system, you can go straight to the edge or you can even go over the edge for some of those pieces. It makes your life a thousand times easier. Yeah, and make sure the main thing when you're doing, when you do get, if you do get an M2, make sure you do the calibration and everything you put inside of it is what the do board knows. So if you think you're going to get a four by eight sheet, and you said, like Lauren said over here, Mr. Jenkins said he got a, you know, an MDF. It's longer, so your do board your, your doesn't know how much to cut. Do you understand what I'm saying? So your calibration. So all numbers actually make a big deal in this. Okay, excellent. Yeah, those are your soft limits for your X and your Y. Mm -hmm. Whenever you go to your first calibration screen, it asks you for the size of your workpiece. So put in the exact dimensions of your real spoil board. Exactly. Not just say, I got a four by eight, measure it. And I do everything in millimeters. That way it's even more accurate. Yeah, don't, with, 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 I, if, for all these, don't use inches, use millimeters. Metric, the Imperial systems are pain in the ass with all these things. You're so much yeah. better off using the metric. And, and the do board is designed in millimeters too. So all the calculations, everything's designed in millimeters. So if you design something in Imperial and then, tr and then transfer it to metric, there's an inherent loss in there and it's going to lose tiny bits of your measurements um, that can cause problems because it's designed to work in millimeters. Um, so you'll, you can lose a little bit of your accuracy if you're switching back and forth and doing those conversions. It can do the conversions, but it'll lose a little bit of accuracy in that process because it, it doesn't line up exactly. So it's just like starting in one place and, and it's like staying in the same measurement system the whole time. It can't just stay in, in Imperial, even if it says that it's in, you know, um, even if it says that it's in like inches and stuff like that, um, it's still converting it to millimeters to run it. So yeah, spoken about diesel also. I was gonna get uh, V carb. I was thinking about doing V carb, but um, can easel handle V carb files or? Uh, uh, well, easel is actually like a V carb, so it's actually maker versus that what you want to use. Yeah, easel basically is a, a V carb, but V carb is way more, you know, in depth. Well, maker versus we're building it to be for anything for um, uh, like. Any, anything that you can work with to, uh, oh, hey, Matt. Um, anything that you can work with to, like, any CNC machine, we're working on it supporting all of them. Um, and eventually supporting any 3D printer and any laser cutter, too, to where, like, you can have a one-stop open source shop for all of your digital G-code creation needs. So that's the goal for Makerverse is to get it to that point, for sure. So real, uh, real, real quick, we have that's, sorry, real quick for somebody that's very frugal. If you're going to start out, um, like Illustrator is a very powerful machine. However, it costs money. So if you want to start out and you're trying to like fill your way into this world, I recommend Inkscape. It's the, it's not that bad. And actually, if I'm running 2D, I run Inkscape. And if I'm running 3D, I run SketchUp free. And, it, and both of them translate very well. Uh, I think I've seen Casey's video. It's I mean, there's so many people that will walk you through these step-by-steps. Um, plus, SVGs can be open in Illustrator or Inkscape and scaled to whatever size to the exact size you want. They're both very good at uh, taking raw images and converting them to SVGs almost for you. Like, it's just, it's very, it's a, it's a cheating way to do it, and it's almost completely free. Um, like, I don't even have Easel Pro. I use the Easel, the free version. Um, and then... If you're like me, which I have a very powerful computer inside, very high-end computer, but I'm not about to put it in my shop where it gets destroyed by the dust. Um, I actually use Google Drives to, to move all my files from one computer to the other instead of like directly sending them. Um, and it's just, I'm, I'm a budget guy. I like to maximize profit. 
So there's a lot of cheaper ways to go than, than going and investing in, you know, software that costs you hundreds of dollars a year. Yeah. Well, just for using a control of the machine, what I recommend to you, if you know, they have a Raspberry Pi image. And if that's the Maker vs. Raspberry Pi image, it's great if you want to just have your, something in the shop. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the, um, and then you can have your machines basically headless in a sense where all your, like all our design machines are in the office. And then our actual, uh, the computers are running. I, I used to have a, a resale shop, so we have a bunch of just Core i7, old, old Core i7s hooked up to them. But, uh, but you, you can throw actually, them all that. Yeah. It doesn't it's, come out of the box like that. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but if you know the Pi, the, if you know Raspberry Pi, stuff like that, then then it's actually a good way if you want to keep a cheap machine out there. And the B3 Plus and the uh, and the four, the Pi four, work really well for that. If not, if you go to scrap, like we're running um, third gen Core i7s with four and eight gigs of RAM on, to run these things, and I just have I actually just have them mounted straight to them, and they work fine. They work beautifully for that. So. Yeah. So real quick, I seen uh, Matt. Yeah, Casey. There that they don't. I seen Matt's reply down there that they don't. He doesn't use Facebook. Um, so I, I can't remember Emily Scott. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, Hi, with, Emily. So they've asked if they could take all those videos. I've actually made three or four of them. They want to take those and put them on the MakerMade site so people can. There's a okay. single place to go Please. and get all of those. So eventually maybe you won't need facebook to see those matt i don't you, you don't mind if we do that i've already talked to her that's that okay. it's fine i i actually did those to help people in the in the community anyway so whether they put them on the site or not it doesn't matter to me okay cool yeah yeah tim we got just we're a little bit over on time so we got just a couple more questions if you guys want to i don't want to leave it just, hanging. yeah just a quick one um you kept mentioning the height of the uh, the beam in relation to the in, in relation to the four by eight sheet, the scrap uh, board, whatever you want to call it, you were saying, is that what you're referring to? Twenty four inches above if it's twelve foot, because on the frame in your manual, it's like ten foot above, uh, ten inches above the above the frame. Is that wrong? Uh, so that's for a ten foot beam. Yeah, right. Okay, that's right. Yeah. That's fine. So that's the difference in the so the the frame guide right now, and and we're kind of working on. Um, we're, we're always working on a million things. Uh, one of the things is trying to figure out um, like more standardized, like 12 foot and 10 foot setups for both wall mounted and for like a movable cart and like a metal version too. And we, you know, basically try to collect a bunch of those from the community and get them all in one place. So then you can kind of like pick through the shopping guide of how you want to build your frame. Like what kind of frame do you want to build? basically um because because you can change it a lot the main thing is just making sure that there's a couple measurements that are always set like that you have a correct distance and everything's exactly. level with itself and and everything's at that 15 degree angle and like getting those getting those measurements set are the big important ones so um yeah the, with that 24 inches that's for that 12 foot beam the nice thing is honestly if you go so i stick with the original frame style um and um for the m1 which works beautifully because i just put casters on them Instead of doing like the wall mount setup, because there's a bunch of different ones you can do. But if you want to make a really easy to build system just to get started, use the original, um, the frame, the original frame, not the wall mount frame. That's great, man. And awesome. just throw casters on it. It makes it super easy. Yeah. Speaking of casters, one of the things I did, because uh, as mentioned on a budget, uh, I put casters on mine, shaved the bottom of the legs off a little bit, and then just put a horizontal beam across, put casters on the beam, and then like, like I said, I ain't got a whole lot of room, so I didn't have room for a full dust collection system. But what I did have room for is some air movers. And uh, that just basically my system is in front of the garage door. When I turn it on, you know, I just turn those air movers on and it constantly, any of the large dust or any of the dust that remains, it just blows right out underneath the garage door. And uh, it avoids, I'm sure there's uh, small amounts of dust in the room. Uh, but that's why I also wear a mask. But for the most part, it's takes two minutes and anything left over i just have a battery powered uh uh what do you call it, blower and i just blow the garage out i'm done and it keeps my dust collection way down with minimal labor awesome another thing we've implemented too is if you need if you if people keep going to imperial system we have a we bought a cattle prod and so anytime the interns use imperial in here or switch the machines to imperial instead of metric they get cattle prodded. It stops it real quick. Uh, Within like true. three or four times, <laughs> you're good. No more, they'll, they'll stick to metric. <laughs> Got a free add on. <laughs> so, uh, does anybody have a question? Okay. 
Hey, thank you very much. Where are you going? Hey, Drew, on the serious side, I need to get, um, do you have time after this? I can get with you because I need to get one of those printers earmarked. I was talking to Chris yesterday. Yeah, I need to get one of those printers earmarked from you. Cool. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. I'll text you afterwards. Okay, bye. Yeah, text me. Okay. Oh, one last thank question. You oh, sorry. Yeah, Dave, what's up? Before I go, uh, recommendations on routers or for that matter, spindles. What are people use and what do they recommend? I bought a Makita and you, we're, we're using that as because I'm familiar with Makita. Um, but we can't get the 701, which I think you'll prove in this country. So we've got the equivalent, which I think is a 700C4X or something. It's exactly the same diameter. It exact, does exactly the same thing. Yeah, and um, if it's a little yeah. smaller, we have adapters that we can send. Um, just yeah, like just, yeah, just send us a message to support at makerme.com and I'll get with you and I'll, I'll send you all the information, all the questions. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah we, use, we use both the Ridge and the... Uh, and the DeWalt, and they both have, each one has their own preferences, but with them too, they both seem to work really well. So I know there's some people in here have, um, last week we we're talking about reasons they like the rigid better than the DeWalt or the DeWalt better than the rigid. But for me, we use both and they, I don't see the same big difference. Yeah, and so DeWalt's the main one that we recommended, but they've been out of stock for a while. So um, pretty much everywhere. And Bosch is another one that's great. You just need a bigger clamp to be able to use it. Um, and then you can do, you know, like Casey's we're probably about to talk to, you can do like big old half inch bits um, and stuff on it. Go big or go home, man. <laughs> big or go home. Uh, mine is a 2.25. I can use everything from a half inch all the way down to a 16th without having to change a router. I just, I prefer the more power, but you do need the 91 millimeter clamp, which is, they have them in stock now. Get one of those, get the Bosch and just be done with it. Hey, so you're right. using a Bosch. That's the two and a quarter horsepower, is what you're saying? Yeah, it's like the Bosch Colt, I think. It's like the Colt. Yeah, it's... there's two different versions. There's two of them, and they're both called the Colt. So one's like a 1.5, and I think the other one's a 2.5. So one's yeah, small. this is the two point, the two point two five. There's like a Colt That's Palm, a... I think. It's like a Colt it's Palm. A, it's an EPS, called. EPS something. I can't okay. remember. Yeah. Okay, and and nobody's using a spindle or a water cooler. Yeah, here, let me pull up the spindle that, and this is one that Chris recommends um with maker made so uh, uh here yeah, we, yeah, talk we, about those i'll pull it up real quick and show it to you we're researching different <laughs> spindles to use um oh. that, we can, that we can move move with but um with the router then you can use it for other applications too in your shop so um yeah with a spindle you have to have a, a solid state drive in it and i mean if you, and then you go water cooled you have to have a water tank and a pump and everything else so just uh if you just do an air cooled with a driver in it a motor driver I mean, a, a decent one that'll get you get you good results. You're talking about starting around 400 bucks. The, the drive for those things is what is expensive. The spindle isn't expensive. It's the damn control system, the drive. Yeah, there's a good one for $400 on Amazon. It works really well. And you can use a bucket. I wouldn't recommend that. You can get like the CW3000 chillers, which we're in Texas. So I actually just stuck ours in a deep freeze. <laughs> but we have big industrial chillers up here. And, I, and I, you can find industrial chillers sometimes used. Um, I, got, I got some huge 20-ton uh, industrial chillers that um, we use for different things. But, uh, yeah, I would, I would, if you're going to do a, a water-cooled, it doesn't have to be uh, – You could there's they, the $400 kit comes with the pump and everything else, and you can just use a big bucket and a cooler. Uh, yeah. But I would recommend uh, looking at, like, just a cheap chiller, too. So starting out – yeah. For me, start out, get, stick with a router, figure it out, get everything dialed in. It's a lower cost solution. It'll get you making things. And then after a little while, if you think the noise is too, too high or something like that, then move to a spindle. But I kind of enjoy my router because when it goes to crap, I just throw it away and buy a new one. If it's a spindle, it's not that simple, right? And But a spindle does have upgrades. I mean, you can control speeds through Makerverse. It has speed control. It has a lot of that other stuff. But for me, it's just a, it's a little overkill for having something in your shop and you know just having fun with it. That's my that's my thing. yeah. And I'm with that too because the other thing too is if you really want to do spindle right, you need to do PWM and do speed control and all that. And so if you're just starting, I would definitely stick with a uh, with a router. So I would I would There's definitely recommend cool spindle too, but it, I would if you're going to go spindle, I would recommend going to water cooled versus the air cooled. But uh, but you're better off with the router right now for the first start okay guys i'm off thank you very much for your help here's the kit here's the spindle kit let me see if i can show you on my computer real quick uh, Lauren, here's the one. Say something, Lauren. 
sir, if, if I was going to make a recommendation just for, for somebody starting out, start off with the rigid. I have the Bosch because that Bosch is, is a beast of a router and, and I love it, but I also got a little bit of a router collection and that's kind of my problem. Um, but the rigid router, if you register it, especially for your first one, and you're probably going to use and abuse it like I did, um, if you register it properly, they will maintain that thing for the life for your first time user life. So you just, if you destroy it, send it back and they'll give you a new one. And I say this, like, you just got to make sure you register it right. And, and if you got questions or whatever, I'm sure that other people can help you. Cause I have a whole line of rigid tools that I have registered, especially if I know that I'm going to going to abuse them. And so far it's been a phone call and within seven days, I've got a new part or a new tool. Um, so for starting out, like I said, and I don't know if, are you here stateside, sir? Yes, I'm in Chicago. So I don't know if they have a direct tools up there, but you can get factory blemished uh, equipment. So normally the rigid routers up closer to $200, but I got mine for a hundred dollars with the warranty. And the only difference was it had a giant hole in the side of the box, but the tool was untouched. Um, and the bag it came in was untouched. So yeah, and it still warranties for the life of the uh, for the life of it. And I'm talking, I abuse the crap out of mine. Um, and then when I get everything dialed in, I also can go back and use my Bosch as needed. Um, just because the Bosch is expensive, it is super nice and it's got more power because it is a beast of a router. Um, but like I said, it doesn't have that lifetime warranty. And if I'm gonna abuse something, use the cheaper model. Casey, is that is that right router using a 91 millimeter clamp? Yeah, okay. it uses the yeah. 91 millimeter, and I bought the... the Rigid does, too. Yeah, I, I bought the kit that comes with the plunge base and stuff. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm kind of like, Lauren, I got a, I, I got four different routers. One in a router table, and then I got two sitting over here on the table, and that one in there. <laughs> but for that machine right there, I'm just a little bit opposite. I, I keep that one in there. I have a quick change-out system for it, so I can change bits for rough and, and fine passes. But I just, I can always count on that additional horsepower on there. And like I said, the, for me, the horsepower means a little extra speed on, on, yep. on mold time. So yeah. I, I, that's the only reason I, I like that. And I can do a half inch bit and just hollow the crap out of wood if I yeah. want to. The 91 millimeter uh, mount just came back in stock at Maker Made. So I'm going to, I'm going to order it. I just was. You, you better know, order it now. <laughs> What? Did you, did you better you, order like right now. <laughs> yeah, because they're 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 trust me, they're going like hotcakes. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't get a we didn't get tons of them, and they yeah, Just, we're all just to have order it like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Matt, did you find a router? I know you were having a hard time finding a router. Did you ever actually find one? Yeah, um, the guys that make it sent, <laughs> sent me an adapter that made the seventy one down to a sixty five, and um, I'm I'm using a Harbor Freight one. And just like, you know, let's just like Lauren said, this one's like 75 bucks and I got the extended warranty or whatever. So if, if anything goes wrong, I'm bringing it back to Harbor Freight and getting a new one. It doesn't have the LEDs and, you know, it's not as fancy as the DeWalt or whatever, but man, I'm going to burn that out. When I do, I'm going to take it back and get another one. So, yeah. but I, I'm power. interested in a bigger one, like the 91 millimeter as well. So yeah, you got a Bauer from Harbor Freight. Yeah, the Bauer one. Yep. Yeah, I did the same thing. I printed a sleeve uh -huh. to go into the into my 91 to yep. then put that small Bauer in there if I want to do something really small and tiny. Yeah. So I've got a sleeve. I just I just printed one, a 3D printed one. And then yeah, I don't have access to a printer. So the guys at Maker Made sent me one. So thanks very much. I really appreciate yeah. it because I'm running now and I wasn't running before. So thank you. That yeah. the DeWalt is really hard to come by. And even though I liked it, I did break it when I was taking the, you know, the, I pushed the little lock in there and I broke the interior piece of it. So I had to send that back. So thanks again, guys. Yeah. I, I, I just got the DeWalt on Amazon and they had like four different people with them. Okay. Sweet. Okay. That's awesome. I'll that's check good. that out. And hey, they just, know. I mean, I got it in two days. Okay. There you go. Hey, Drew, what's awesome. the printer's going to be um, in stock? My, uh, my uh, old reality printer is about on its last leg. When do you guys hey. when are you guys getting yours back in stock? We're hoping that they're going to be here and ready to go on like the fifth, the week of the fifteenth. It looks like so the parts are coming. Uh, it'll be by the end of the month for sure. So I'm pretty stoked. It'll be just a couple weeks. So yeah, I'm excited about it. 
I'll, I'll hook you up with some print and stuff too. It'll be sweet. <laughs> yeah, I'm up and... I need to get one here soon. I'm, I've got a bunch yeah. of stuff that I'm printing, and this thing it just keeps breaking down. I'm spending more money on. Just make sure to sign up and um, sign up. That way, whenever it becomes available, you'll get that email. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. All and right, guys. Got... Does anybody have any more questions before we go? I got that. Uh, it's actually running now and printing. So. No, the, 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 the decode the and. I'm printing awesome. a star in my daughter's name and a piece of plywood. That's card. fantastic. Yeah, sweet. Nice. Nice. So, it's All right, y'all. Well, hey, thanks a lot. Thank this you. was awesome. This is great conversation today, y'all. This is exactly um, the kind of stuff that I love being a part of. So this is great. Thanks a lot for everybody for contributing. And then we'll see you next week. And if not, before then, you can you can hit us up um, online on uh, in the owners group or at support at makermade.com and we'll get you going. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. See you all. Have a good one. Bye.